Yeah, so I'm going to give a presentation with the maybe slightly cryptic title, Breeding Fillmore's Chickens and Hatching the Eggs, Recombining Frames and Roles uh, in Frame Semantic Parsing. So uh, this is work um, that um, comes from a paper that uh, Malvina Nissim, my supervisor, uh, and me recently got accepted at IWCS which will uh, be held later this month. Uh, but I, uh, we thought it would be super interesting to present it here as well, like for a more like a uh, FrameNet specific audience. Um, if you're interested, you can uh, find our paper at this link, bit.ly slash fill more eggs. Uh, and also if you're interested, our uh, models and, and other source code are all also available on, online. All right, so uh, I guess I should just begin by explaining this somewhat weird title. So what does Fillmore have to do with eggs? Um, so basically, well, you might have guessed that it's a rather <laughs> shallow metaphor, I guess. Um, this paper is about the chicken or egg problem of frames and semantic roles. So basically what comes first, what depends on what, and how can you apply that when you're dealing with uh, frame semantic parsing. Um, so uh, in particular, we're going to look at uh, when you do frame, frame semantic parsing, how should you do, uh, how should you order the different components of the pipeline? If you're not familiar with this, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to get there pretty soon. Um, and also we're going to look at large scale language models, which are, uh, as you probably all know, a very uh, big thing in natural language processing these days and look at what layers of these models are used for uh, semantic frames and semantic roles. So first let's talk a little bit about what a frame actually is. Um, so if we go all the if we go all the way back to case grammar, um, we had a definition of uh, frames where frames were very clearly defined by deep cases or uh, or semantic roles. Um, uh, well, I'm I'm not an expert in case grammar, but from what I um, know from it, there there were uh, there were case frames which are basically just sets of semantic of what would later uh, come to be called uh, semantic roles. Then later, um, Fillmore wrote, a frame is any system of concepts related in such a way that to understand any one of them, you have to understand the whole structure in which it fits. So their frames became something different, not just does the frame depend on the roles, but it's, it's just this kind of unbreakable uh, interdependent structure. And then in frame net, um, frames are indeed these kinds of structures. They are structures that consists of lexical units, of frame elements, and of frame-to-frame -frame relations. Uh, and you can't really see frames and roles apart from each other. Now, um, when we look at frame semantic parsing, so that is the task of uh, analyzing uh, a text in terms of frame net frames using some kind of computational algorithm. Um, traditionally, this is actually done in a very particular order. I think this order was first used uh, in Semival 2007. And basically uh, you start from raw text and then the first step is to identify which elements in the text actually um, introduce a semantic frame, in, evoke a semantic frame. So that's what uh, you could call target ID. So in, in these examples, the target is, is the same. In each case, it's ren. And then once you have those targets, the next step is to do frame identification, which is to identify which frame that frame corresponds to each tar target. And um, of course it can also turn out that um, a particular uh, word that you, that might be a target doesn't actually evoke a frame in frame. For example, here, um, we have all different senses of Ren, and th this last one is a very specific one. His girlfriend ran him home, which means uh, drove him home, basically. 
And that's a sense that, uh, as far as I'm aware, is currently not covered in FrameNet. So here you would actually not want to uh, tag anything. And then the last step of the pipeline is to do argument identification, uh, where you assign semantic role labels to um, each of the arguments of uh, the predicate that you're dealing with. Uh, so basically, uh, like, why would you want to do this in the first place? So, um, well, you want to do frame net analysis because you have some piece of raw text that you would want to be analyzed. And then uh, you would want to use that analysis for some other thing um, that could be, um, oh wait, sorry, the <laughs> animations are appearing in the wrong order. Sorry for that. Um, so basically, why would you want to have such a frame analysis at all? Well, one thing would of course be to do uh, some kind of linguistic in investigation related to frames. For that, it might be useful to have some kind of automatic way of assigning frames to a given text. But apart from that, there are, there are all kinds of applications in uh, natural language processing. Um, so one, the one that I'm working on uh, specifically, or that the, the project group that I'm part of rather is working on this framing of events. So given an event, try to see how this event could be framed in different ways. But there are also many other uh, tasks like relation extraction, sentence similarity, information extraction, narrative completion, uh, which are all uh, what we could call downstream tasks of frame net analysis, which have been covered in recent work in NLP. But so far, most uh, frame semantic models focus on uh, only once on, on, on specific components of the pipeline rather uh, than on the problem end-to-end. Uh, -end. So end-to-end -end is basically what we have here. You go from raw text, you go to the frame structures, and then you can use those for something. But most models don't really look at the problem this way, but look at the specific component. And actually, it seems like uh, the overwhelming majority of the work that is there deals with argu argument identification specifically, which is, I, I, which is of course a very interesting and also difficult problem. Uh, but if you want to actually use your, um, your frame analysis, your automatic frame analysis for something, um, then you probably also want to look at the task like as a whole. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. And so specifically, we're looking at whether the um, traditional pipeline of doing first target identification, then frame identification, then argument identification is the only or even the best way of approaching uh, frame semantic parsing as an end-to-end -end task. Um, so basically, our main intuition here is that there are different dependencies between the different parts of the pipeline. So here's um, one dependency, which is between target identification and frame identification. Actually, without knowing anything about frames, it's hard or even impossible to say whether a given word or a given token, basically, uh, since we're uh, talking about um, a natural language processing context, if a given token evokes a frame or not. you almost cannot do that without already, well, thinking, uh, quote unquote, uh, a bit about what frame this token is actually supposed to invoke. For example, in this last example, where you have something that is not covered in FrameNet, um, you would probably, like if you want to have uh, an analysis that's 100% correct, you would not want to tag this as a target at all because it's something that doesn't evoke a frame, at least not with, uh, frame that as it is right now. Uh, it could, of course, um, evoke a frame if, if only the right frame existed. Um, and then maybe more interestingly, um, if you look at frame identification versus argument identification, so you also see, or at least we think there are a lot of dependencies that don't always go in one direction. So in a traditional pipeline, you do first frames, 
than arguments. And of course, that makes sense because like the kinds of semantic rules that you can have really depend on the frame, of course. But also, if you want to find the right frame, and especially in ambiguous cases like you have here, Angela ran to school, a tear ran down my cheek, we ran out of cookies, uh, which all have very different senses of the word run, of the, uh, yeah, the word run. Um, what you want to do is look at the sentential context to find out which frame applies here. And to do that, probably the most informative information comes from the semantic rules. So for example, in Angela ran to school, you have an animate agent. And that's probably a pretty important part of um, the self motion frame where you have some, someone or something that is deliberately moving. Whereas um, in a tear ran down my cheek, you have a tear, which is a kind of fluid. Uh, and that's something that's very typical for fluidic motion. All right, so that's our intuition behind why you might want to try to approach the problem in a different way. Um, so let's look at uh, our approach. Our approach has basically two important components. Um, one is that we redefine the problem uh, of frame semantic parsing. So instead of looking at structures directly, um, what we do is we define the problem as a sequence labeling architecture because this uh, makes the uh, this makes the whole uh, setup that we can use much more flexible and it's much easier to um, try different orders of uh, or different combinations of the different components of the pipeline. So uh, in this picture at the top on the right you see frame structures. So the, the example here is Boris screamed and ran home. And then you have two, uh, two, two frame structures here. One comes from the frame make noise, which is evoked by scream. And one comes from self motion, which is evoked by Ren. And then each of those has its set of uh, semantic roles. So how we represent this in our approach is basically uh, for each token, you can have any number of labels and here, uh, the labels that are prefixed with R are role labels, and the ones prefixed with F are frame labels. Um, and based, so you so the picture is a bit misleading actually because you still still see the colors which like correspond to the structural information that you see in the part on the right, but actually we remove this. So the the system would only see okay Boris has the tags R self mover and R sound source indicating that it has like a role in both of these uh, frames, but we actually remove the information which frame um, each uh, role belongs to. And also we remove the structural information. And this is basically um, all in an effort to try to reduce the label space to make it easier to learn for uh, a neural network model. All right, so once we have this, uh, this general architecture or this general um, problem definition rather in place, we can try to experiment with different ways of splitting and recombining the traditional pipeline. So our basic building blocks uh, are called frames only and roles only. And that basically means um, that in frames only, you're just gonna predict uh, frames or actually the targets and frames. So given a sentence, you're gonna uh, predict which tokens evoke a frame and also which frame. So that's already combined in, in one step. And then the other uh, basic building block is called roles only, where for every token you predict, okay, does this token, is this part of a span of a semantic role? Um, and then which role? Um, so this is what we call the strip setup. It's the most simple one. We, we just do everything separately. There's no interaction between frame prediction and role prediction. Uh, then the second possibility is merged, um, which is basically um, you have these, these two components and then you merge the outputs um, so that you can make a full frame structure prediction. Okay, so, so far we've done nothing really too interesting. Uh, 
Um, it gets more interesting when we try to recombine the different parts of the pipeline, but in, uh, in different ways. So one is joint. This is actually something that has been tried before in the literature and that has been shown to, uh, to work. So basically we try to predict frames and rolls at the same time, instead of um, one by one. We have two different sub setups. I'm yeah, not gonna bother here with the exact difference. Well, but basically in, in multi-label, you for every token, you just predict one uh, combination of labels, which could be either roll labels or frame labels. And in multi-task, um, there are two, uh, two models doing uh, doing both tasks, but at the same time, and they share some representations. Um, then the neo traditional um, is the thing in our setup that comes closest to the original pipeline. Um, and basically, we first apply frames only, uh, and then we use that as the input of roles only. So roles only is done with not as input, not just uh, the raw text, but also the frames that have been predicted by the frames only component. And this part is meant to investigate whether having information about frames helps you actually helps you predict roles. And then, then in reverse traditional, we're trying to do it the other way around. Um, so we actually first predict the roles and then use those as input for predicting the frames. Uh, and then you see, uh, as a final thing, you see these little uh, green boxes uh, in, in, in these two cases. That means that where in the, in the experiments that we did with roles only, what we also tried was replacing roles only by the roles as predicted by multi-label. But I'll, I'll get a bit later as to why we did that and, and why that matters. All right, so how did we do our experiments? Um, what we did and we think, so at least at the time that we did these experiments, we were the only ones doing that. I think since there have been a few other systems uh, that also uh, use BERT, which is, if you don't know it, it's a large scale neural language model. So that means um, it is a model that has seen a very large set of unlabeled text in English. So that's called uh, the pre-training phase. And then once you have this pre-training in place, you can use this model to produce contextualized word representations. So that rep so basically that gives you a numer numerical representation for each token in the input, which is the which is uh, kind of sensitive to the context in the sentence. So for example, in the examples that we saw, where you have ran in a used in a different meaning, those are going to have different, uh, each instance of run uh, is going to have a different representation in these different sentences. Uh, and BERT has been shown to uh, improve performance on many semantic uh, tasks. So we use BERT as the base for our model. And then on top of that, we add a very simple neural network that can do sequence labeling. Um, and then we uh, fine tune this model uh, given the standard frame net uh, data set. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna bother here with the label representations. Um, and as a baseline, we use open sesame, which is basically the best traditional model that we're aware of. So that has different steps for target identification, frame identification and argument identification. Um, all right, so let's go to some results. So we use several ways of uh, running and evaluating our models. Um, and the first one, um, so, we, so we have to do evaluation in a little bit different way than was done by previous systems, exactly because of the simplification step that we did um, to, for uh, transforming the problem into a sequence labeling problem. Um, so basically uh, the, the simplest way you can evaluate our model uh, is by simply counting like how often you get the right labels per token. So this doesn't look at structures, frame structures as, as such at all. Um, 
And the nice thing about this is that here we can get a good sense of what is done on frames individually versus on roles individually, rather than on the, the whole structures. So our first finding is that our frame prediction quality is quite similar to Open Sesame. On the dev set, we're actually a little bit better when it comes to frame prediction, uh, whereas on the test set, uh, we're a little bit worse, but not that much. Um, so that's just to, to, uh, to basically show that our model, uh, while not great, actually Open Sesame is also not the state of the art anymore in frame semantic parsing. But at least this shows that our models perform reasonably well, at least. Um, OK, then finding number two, we found that uh, frame prediction does not seem to benefit much from role prediction. So here uh, at the bottom in the, the pink squares uh, show um, our scores on frame prediction, which is uh, done on its own. So there's two different variants embedding and sparse. Um, yeah, I don't think I have time to uh, explain exactly the difference, um, but that's what you get when you predict frames on their own. Um, then here in the blue box, uh, no, sorry, in the orange box is what happens if you do frames and roles jointly. Um, if you predict a joint representation of uh, frames and roles, that works uh, significantly worse. Um, and then in the blue box are uh, some of the other setups, but they actually have in common um, that they involve a separate model for, uh, uh, for frame prediction, which is then combined with role prediction in different ways. So in none of the setups, uh, well, so actually one that's, that is interesting to mention is the roles only, where you do frame prediction with roles as input, and actually the results are uh, they don't get worse compared to the other setups, but they also don't uh, get better. Uh, all right, so then let's go to finding number three, which is uh, for role prediction, we find that you do get the benefit from having roles together with frames, either through joint prediction or through a pipeline. So here, um, multi-label is actually best. So uh, just predicting frames and rules at the same time works pretty well. And this, this is actually something that we also know from um, the previous literature. But the advantage of our approach is that we can uh, compare this directly using like, the exact uh, same setup, uh, except for the different orderings um, to compare with what happens if you use a pipeline. Uh, approach. So, um, uh, so we we find here that near traditional, so using so predicting first frames and then using those as input for role prediction, uh, also works well. Uh, sorry, it actually works a little bit better than multi-label. Sorry, I, I said that the wrong way around. I think before, um, but that also works. Um, but if you um, do roles apart. So if you do roles on their own or do roles before predicting frames, that gets you much worse results. And that's what you see in the orange boxes. Uh, all right. Um, then um, it's, it's well, it's nice to have these results for uh, frame semantic parsing as a sequence labeling problem, but that's a quite different approach than what's done in the previous literature. And uh, ideally, we would also like to say something about how uh, good the frame structures are that are predicted by our model. Um, so for this, what we need to do um, is actually go back from the sequence labels, which you see here. Uh, so this is the same figure that we had before. So before we went from frame structures to sequence labels to kind of simplify the problem, make the uh, overall architecture more flexible. But now we actually want to get back to these frame structures. And what we did uh, was build a simple uh, rule-based algorithm uh, that given a label uh, tries to, given a set of labels for a given sentence, tries to find out what goes with what. So in this case, you want to figure out that self. So if you have the role self mover, 
that that actually comes from the self motion frame and not from the make noise frame, which is also present in the sentence. And in this case, it's trivial because there's no overlap between the role labels of the different frames. And there's only one instance in the sentence of each frame. If you have more complicated cases where you have overlap in roles uh, between the frames or between different instances of the same frame, you could run into problems. Um, but um, as we found, it seems that our heuristics actually tend to work pretty well. So we, um, so the way that we uh, investigated this was by looking at the scores for Open Sesame, because Open Sesame, um, because of how it's uh, as designed, does predict full uh, frame structures rather than sequence tables. And so what we could do is actually remove the structural information from the outputs of Open Sesame. Um, and then see uh, like if the structures that we got from Open Sesame directly versus from Open Sesame with the structural information first removed and then reconstructed using our heuristics, uh, we found that when you do structural evaluation using the semi 2007 algorithm actually produces almost the same results. You do uh, lose a little bit in performance, but not so much. So that's uh, that's nice because it gives uh, some credibility to our whole sequence labeling framework. Uh, all right, then the next finding I want to discuss is that overall um, our sequence labeling model performs clearly worse than Open Sesame. Um, which perhaps is to be expected from what we saw before, because we saw that while frames work um, almost at the same level as open sesame, rules are worse. Um, so it makes sense that if you look at overall predictions, uh, there would also be a difference, but it was actually uh, a bit larger than we expected, at least on the development set. But interestingly here, uh, when we look at structural predictions, our models actually do relatively well on the final test set compared to the development set. Um, uh, and there actually we see that our best system, so for example, this one, um, merge multi-label gets a F score of 0.47 versus open sesame, which gets one of 0.50. Uh, the difference is not huge, fortunately. Um, right, so uh, interestingly, we find that the two best, best models when looking at overall structure, uh, structure prediction, um, we find that the best ones are merged multi-label. So merged multi-label means that you, um, that you first predict frames and roles at the same time using the joint model and then also predict frames separately. So this is a bit of a, uh, of a trick because we found in the earlier experiments that when you do um, frames and roles together, this benefits the roles, but not the frames. So we do that. And then we, we, we do that so that we get the best possible roles. And then we also know that doing frames separately gives better frames. So we just also do that and then just uh, put the results all together. Um, and interestingly, that's also what works uh, best in this case. So we get up to 47 um, points of F score. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, the reverse traditional pipeline. So that's where we do first uh, role prediction and then use that as input for frame prediction. Before, so in the previous slides, I actually uh, mentioned that this didn't work so well, at least it didn't do what we expected it to do, which is to improve a frame prediction quality. Um, but apparently, um, for some reason, which we can't uh, really explain, actually, um, this is still one of the better models for producing overall uh, best predictions. We also found that the neo-traditional approach, so the, the one that emulates a tr traditional pipeline, also performs um, quite well, but only on the, the columns that we call modified. So we took the standard semifold 2007 evaluation script, which uh, evaluates frame structures 
but uh, by default, this um, this way of evaluation is very strict when it comes to uh, role spans. So, uh, for example, we noticed that there were that there seemed to be some inconsistencies where sometimes um, even in the even in the in the in the gold data, so in the frame net data set, sometimes um, commas and periods are included as part of a role constituent, and sometimes they aren't. Um, and then in the standard semi false script, if you get that wrong, if you wrongly predict, if you if you're just missing one token in a role span, or you have or you have one extra, then that whole uh, span is counted as wrong. Uh, and we thought that it would be interesting to see what happens if you exclude these kinds of errors and give partial credit to partially correct roles, uh, role spans. And then uh, interestingly, when you look only at the modified columns, um, then neo-traditional works almost as well as the uh, two best systems. Um, whereas when you look at the strict evaluation, uh, the scores really drop. So that suggests that for some reason, the neo-traditional model, uh, by contrast to the other ones, has um, some difficulties with, um, or has more difficulties um, getting the rule spans exactly right. Um, so um, here are the here's the final results table that I'm going to show you, um, which is uh, which comes from the experiment where we repeated what we did before. So we repeated the sequence labeling experiment, but instead of um, using the whole BERT model as input, uh, as a source for input representations, we use single layers from the BERT model. So uh, the reason that we did this is that in previous literature, um, there, uh, there have been investigations into um, the question whether uh, language models like BERT can actually learn to reproduce a pipeline, which is also kind of what we're doing here. It has been tried on pipelines other than frame semantic parsing, of course, but we thought the same general idea applies. And what we found is that for role predictions, so that's what you see here, the results get better and better when you use higher and higher layers of the model, which seems to uh, correspond to the intuition that the higher you go in these kinds of models, the more abstract and the more semantic um, the information that is represented there is. Uh, but interestingly, when we look at frames, you see something different. Um, and we actually find that by that we get better results by not using individual layers, but a mix of all layers. Um, and also when you do when you do look at individual layers, there seems to be some improvement going from earlier layers to later layers, but it's not by far as much as what we saw for roles. Uh, so that's some, something interesting that we can't quite explain. All right, so um, we're at the end of the presentation. I'm just gonna sum up our main contributions. So in, in our paper, we investigate end-to-end -end approaches to frame semantic parsing. We introduce a flexible sequence labeling framework um, and look at different kinds of setups. And we found that um, while some setups are better than others, it really depends on how you evaluate some. Sometimes one uh, can look better uh, than the other, depending on uh, what you're interested in, if it's mostly frames you're interested in or roles or the structures as a whole. But in general, we can say that rule prediction does seem to benefit from frame prediction. Um, but on the other hand, frames are best predicted alone, which kind of kind of goes against our original intu uh, intuition that information from uh, semantic rules should be useful for predicting semantic frames. And finally, we found that frame prediction and rule prediction make different use of representations in the BERT model. Um, but we can't explain exactly where these come from. Um, that was my presentation. Thank you very much for listening.